and thank all of you for being here this evening. This is great. How are you guys feeling? Wonderful. Excellent, excellent. I almost feel like I'm um, in clinic or something. I see so many people I know, right? So many faces. It's a little scary, actually, but it's great. So again, I'd like to thank Karen Burke White, as she mentioned. She and I have worked um, for actually the past probably nine years on, on working on this issue of cancer disparities. Um, and uh, our work is not finished yet, and so we're very pleased uh, to have her actually encourage us to bring this amazing exhibit right here uh, to Mass General Hospital. So thank you, Karen, and thank you very much to the Faith-Based uh, Cancer Disparities Network that was very instrumental in bringing it to life. Um, also, again, want to thank the museum, the Russell Museum. Um, how many people, this is your first time being in a museum? Wow, awesome. Well, I know many people might not even know it was here, so now you know it's here, and now you know it's free, and so hopefully you'll come back again and again. Um, the exhibits that you see actually rotate, and the Faces of Faith exhibit will actually rotate off 16th of the last day. So if you have uh, friends, colleagues, family members who um, haven't had a chance to see it yet, please encourage them to come by and see it, both internally, but also the huge posters that you can see as you're walking or driving along the street. So please take advantage of that. Sarah, thank you so much um, for uh, allowing us to bring the exhibits. And Michelle, again, thank you so much for all the logistics. Um, Arch, uh, really the vision for the, the whole display again. And Sarah, um, um, I must say, again, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, and finally, um, Elizabeth Powell, who um, is the program manager for the Lazarus MGH Cancer Care Program, which you'll hear a little bit about this evening. Um, thank you so much, because this work would not have been able to ha happen without you. And of course, I have to thank my husband sitting right here in the first row, because <laughs> he tolerates all of this. All right. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, I think within this, with, in the spirit of being in a museum, whose primary mission is not only to celebrate history, the history of medicine, particularly the, the uh, beautiful things that have happened right here at Mass General Hospital, they also focus on innovation. So thinking about both history and innovation, my talk tonight is actually going to reflect both of those themes. First, I want to give some definitions. What are cancer disparities? We'll go through that. And but I do want to talk about the historical context of health disparities in general, not just reflective of cancer disparities, but really all health disparities. And I'm going to focus in on health disparities related to the black community. So that has been my primary focus since I've been here in Boston, and you'll see why when you look at some of the numbers that describe the incidents of the issue about cancer disparities. We'll talk about this, the social determinants of health, and finally we'll talk about community engagement and the importance thereof and how you, yes you, you will be involved, how you too can be involved in this whole process. We want every single person who's here, every single person who's in the community and the community of Boston or the community and the health centers, Whatever our communities are, however you define that, we want you to be engaged in this whole process. So why don't we um, talk a little bit about um, just some general information about cancer statistics. It's the number two cause of death in the United States. Counts for near, nearly one in four deaths. And so people might say, well, why is that a big deal? Well, it's huge, right? If this is a major cause of death, we should be really doing a good job in terms of educating our communities about this issue and making sure that all communities have equal access to screening that's available and to any treatments that might be available. It also results in death, unfortunately. Not many deaths each year if you look at it in terms of totality, but the fact of the matter is is that we have lots of people who are living with cancer, as you can see by testimonies on the walls by the patients who agreed to have their photos taken, but there is a disparity with respect to not only incidence, but prevalence and mortality. What does that mean? There's a difference in terms of which peoples have unequal burden for cancer. So this is just, a, I showed this slide quite a bit in some of my talks because I think it's quite interesting. These are some of the top cancers that we see in the United States, lung cancer being one of the most um, common causes of death. If you look at the incidence based on race or ethnicity, um, blacks get, the, get lung cancer most often. So incidence means the number of new cases per year. So blacks get lung cancer most often. I don't know how many of you knew that. Sometimes communities don't even think about blacks getting lung cancer, but they do. Um, blacks are dying of lung cancer at a great rate. Okay, so they have a higher incidence of your dying of other disease. Colon cancer, same thing. Blacks are diagnosed with colon cancer at a much higher rate. And blacks are dying of colon cancer at a much higher rate than any other race or ethnic group. 
And the greatest incidence, and the greatest disparity in terms of incidence or number of new cases is actually with men and prostate cancer. So black men get prostate cancer at a rate of almost two to one compared to any other race or ethnic group. Two to one, which is huge. And so their death rate accordingly is just as high and probably even disproportionately higher, almost two and a half times as high as mortality. So there's a problem there, but we have to figure out where the problem lies. I think what I find most distressing is this fact, that although white women here have the highest incidence of <coughs> breast cancer, look who's dying of breast cancer. It's black women. Yeah. And so herein lies this issue of cancer disparities, and this is why I've chosen to focus my attention in, in the community, in the black community. This is a huge problem, and we've got to try to figure out what some of the answers are. It's not a new problem. Here are some of the trends. These are cancer incidence trends that date back to 1975. And again, black men having the highest incidence across all of the time points, certainly getting better. Does anybody know what this little spike here is for men? That's a PSA. So that's prostate, that's where we had screening. Um, so that's where that came into play. But look, white women have a slightly higher in increased incidence than black women when it comes to overall cancer rates, but most of that is driven by um, breast cancer incidence and also skin cancers. But here's the trend again. Black men, even though we're doing better, we're getting those, those curves to close in, black men are still dying of cancer at a rate much, much higher than white men. And here again is that, <coughs> that black women, despite having a lower incidence of cancer, is dying. They're dying of, of cancers at a much higher rate. So we've got to figure out how we can <coughs> deal with this. The problem has been published, it's been spoken about, it's been studied over and over again. We hear reports both in the medical journals, but also the lay folks have talked about it. We saw an article or um, a presentation on Fox News. Why breast cancer kills more black women? They're sicker. And you know what? They're right. Unfortunately, when we look at the leading national health disparities across the board, black men and black women have higher risks for almost every single disease entity. Cardiovascular disease, number one killer in blacks. Cancer, you know, blacks have the highest death rate. Diabetes, HIV, AIDS. In fact, black women have the highest rate, of increasing rate of HIV accrual in the United States. Black women. Infant mortality. Do you know that infant mortality here in this country among some populations is actually worse than some developing nations? We have the most expensive health care in the world, and yet we have infants that are dying. Asthma, mental health, again, across the board, if you look at all of these disease entities, black men and black women have poorer outcomes than any other race or ethnic group. So that leads to a much higher overall death. So blacks are dying of disease. And blacks are dying of diseases they don't need to. But this is not a new, as I mentioned. And in fact, the United States Congress requested the Institutes of Medicine to study and assess the extent of health disparities and also to provide recommendations. What can we do? OK, this is a problem. Let's not just keep talking about the problem. Let's talk about solutions. And that's, in fact, what they were charged with. And this group came up with this document entitled Unequal Treatment and How Are We Confronting the Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare? They weren't just focused on blacks, they were focused on all racial and ethnic minorities. And indeed found significant variations in terms of the race of medical procedures, including simple things that you would think wouldn't matter regardless of person's race. Cardiac catheterization. Black man, white man, both of them walk into the emergency room, have chest pain. But one of them gets a cardiac cath, the other one does not. Why is that? Because it's, it's simply because of a person's race. And the racial and ethnic minorities, bottom line, they were experiencing lower quality of health services here in the United States. So I actually thought that this would be a good time to talk a little bit about history. These are <clears throat> some light reading for you guys. This is actually volume two, okay, <laughs> of this anthology. And when I say so, Drs. Clayton and, and Bernie Clayton are phenomenal, um, and they are at the School of Public Health here, and um, they've done an amazing job at cataloging all of these issues that have plagued the black community in this country forever, okay? Um, so you can see the dates are uh, 2000, up to 2000. So instead of me having you guys read that for homework, I figured what I would do is give you a little bit of an overview um, in literally four slides. I've kind of condensed it into four slides of what this huge anthology talks about. 
Their quotes, blacks have had the most oppressive race-based history in the country. The most oppressive race-based health history in the country. Not based on socioeconomic status, right? We hear that frequently, but really just based on race. And if you look at it, and we'll talk about it, the healthcare system has been segregated at all levels, starting with the delivery system, but also in terms of training of physicians, and also health policy infrastructure. So we've got a little bit of work to do in terms of how do we go about dealing with a system that has for so long been divisive, how do we then change that paradigm? Why even bother, though? From my perspective, are we still seeing these health disparities? In order to make any progress moving forward, we have got to understand the historical context. We are not going to be able to make progress in terms of understanding what people are dealing with every day if we don't look back and acknowledge what's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And this is not new, right? Those who can't learn from history, doomed to repeat it, right? Mm -hmm. and we've got to stop this roller coaster ride. I like to show this, not just for the shock value, mm -hmm. but really to remind folks that this is the reality of blacks here in this country. And I'm talking about blacks who are descendants of slaves. Remember that this nation was built on slavery. It was a huge component of the economics of this country. And in fact, slavery existed from almost day one. Let's go back to 1600s. All right. This timeline was pulled right out of this book in terms of I pulled down uh, the numbers. But what's interesting is remember when slavery first was initiated, there were white slaves. There were Native American slaves, there were Chinese slaves, there were slaves from all over the place. It didn't matter. What happened is in 1700, the US government decided to make slavery a race-based institution. And how did they do that? Well, they can't say, oh, black people are going to be slaves. What they did is they said any non-Christian, those were the only people who could be slaves were non-Christian folks. And it happened to be that most of those were black slaves coming from Africa. So what I'd like to do is walk you through the steps of this um, timeline. I'm going to focus primarily um, on the first part. I'm not going to go through, obviously, the all uh, 200 years. I think that you guys will be asleep by the time I finish. Um, but I'll just show that in one slide. And then we'll talk more. I'm kind of, literally, I'm going to do this in three slides. Um, let's go first to the pre-Civil War era. So if we look at the 1600s, up until the time of the Emancipation Proclamation, remember blacks were chattel. They were property. They were owned. They were bought and sold. Their children were taken from there. Their children were taken and bought and sold. Their children were raped, mutilated. That's what slavery did. And in fact, blacks were given the minimum care because what their purpose was was to work. But you needed them to be somewhat healthy, right? So you can imagine a long journey over the seas, etc. People came off the boats. They were sick. They got a little bit of care. There was always some standard for us. But just enough so they can get out to the field and work. And they work from sunup until sundown. So care, substandard. But if the person became too ill, they said, oh, all right, we're going just, to we'll just take our losses on this one. And they allowed people to die because, again, those black slaves were not seen as human. They were property. Blacks and Native Americans were also used as test subjects and non-consensual medical experiments. will help you understand a little bit of the context when I start talking about clinical trials, right? Cancer care, clinical trials, the two should go together, but we have a huge problem in our society because people have a history of being used and abused, maybe a little non-trusting of the medical system that gives those. So this is an amazing book, Medical Apartheid. Um, I don't have a copy to show you because it's on my um, it's on my iPad, um, but it actually talks about experimentation from colonial times and even to modern times. You'll be surprised about what happens even nowadays. The problem is not over. Let's move on to emancipation and reconstruction. So, really, who saw the movie Glory? Denzel Washington. Hey. Oh, whoops. I didn't say that. Loud. So, um, is that, oh, oh, hi, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> so that movie was actually about the 54th Regiment that was from Massachusetts, right? The first U.S.-based regiment that actually fought in the Civil War. Now, certainly blacks fought in the earlier wars, but they fought on both sides. This is the first U.S. black regiment. Amazing. 
But do you remember that scene where they're here they are, they're got they're all prepared, they're ready, they're on the battlefield, and they have a white regiment that walks past and starts calling them all sorts of names. Right? They were fighting on the same side. Fighting on the same side. I had the pleasure of actually going to a lecture, and I apologize, I'm drawing a blank now on her name. She's from Duke University and came to get a historical um, uh, context of medical care um, and, the, and the medical care for during the Civil War, and talked about the huge disparity in terms of the medical care that even soldiers got. So here again, these were soldiers, they were black, but they were soldiers who were fighting the Civil War, who were getting substandard therapy. And often, you know, it's amazing that they even survived some of them, but um, incredible, incredible. They're fighting on the same side. What's interesting, the blacks were not allowed to use the white hospital. <coughs> this is afterward. You talk about when they get freed. Remember the Emancipation Proclamation around 1860s, 1863. Um, the Freedmen's Bureau was actually established in, in 1865, and it was a way to try to provide resources for freed slaves. Okay, so great. So War I, woo Emancipation Proclamation. It's written. Now what do you do? You have people who have been enslaved for centuries, and now they're free. How do you get them to have a life on their own. And so the Freedmen's Bureau was there to educate, but also provided hospitals. There are about 90 hospitals that were created through the South starting in 1965. What was interesting, only by 1868, only one existed. That's the Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, D.C., which is now part of Howard University. So, much so. Right? so that one hospital was the only one that was still there that was able to provide care for these wounded soldiers or people who had been Slave, enslaved peoples. There was only one hospital in the entire country. Let's move forward now. So here we are, after emancipation, free, we're moving into the Jim Crow era. Remember that, again, this timeline, here we are, right here in this area here, I'm moving toward the Civil Rights Movement. Um, the Civil Rights upheld, uh, with Plessy vs. Ferguson, Ferguson, the, the, the um, Supreme Court upheld racial segregation. They said that, okay, Slavery, we're going to do away with that, but we're going to keep everything separate. And there were certain states that they were completely allowed to remain separate but equal, right? Educational system in particular. But the medical establishment also followed that, separate but equal. So the, there were facilities that were set aside just for blacks and just for whites. And again, blacks didn't always have access to this. What was also interesting during this time is that medical experimentation continued. This is the era for Tuskegee, so that's like the big name that people hear of. And I know some people think about Tuskegee as a medical experiment that was done in the city of Tuskegee, but I don't have details. This was a study that was performed, an observational study that was performed by the United States Public Health Service. It was performed by the U.S. government. An observational study to see well, what does syphilis do with black people? when it becomes advanced. And in fact, even though the people were told, these men, black men, were told that they were getting care for their bad blood, um, they were being given aspirin or other things that were really not helpful. Even though the drug at the time that would have cured them, penicillin, was available. So, in order to help combat some of these, blacks initiated their own medical schools and their hospitals. And what was interesting is that there were 14 hospitals that were established, and 14 medical schools that were established during this time. I'm not gonna, actually, there were a lot more um, hospitals. I'm not gonna go into the hospitals, but the medical, medical schools were important. And I'll tell you why in a minute. There were 14 medical schools that were established during the Jim Crow era. But what's interesting, look at this. 1870, Lincoln University to 1874. Four years and closed. This one in New Orleans, one year, closed. There are some that lasted longer. So the Leonard Medical School, so I went to Duke University for medical school, and so the Leonard um, is, it has some ties to Duke, and um, there was a Lincoln Hospital that was established as part of the training grounds for the physicians who actually, for the medical st students who graduated out of Leonard Shaw, they would come to Lincoln to get their training, their further training. But that was the only one that really persisted. 12 hospitals, 12 medical schools, excuse me, open and closed. Training black physicians, not training black physicians. And what happened was, around this time, if you think about it, was the Flexner Report came out, um, and that actually was really led to many of these schools closing because they were told that they were not essentially worth anything. And also, the Flexner Report also stated that blacks were not worth educating. They were not worth, they were not able to become physicians. And so that was a challenge, so how do you overcome that? What's interesting, though, that Flexner Report did save two schools, Howard University and Meharry, right? 
So because they said, oh, well, these have good enough, you know, uh, training grounds, we'll go ahead and keep those two going. And in fact, coordinated <coughs> ways for the government to actually support those two schools. And I believe that this Howard still continues to get some of that governmental funding to help continue their, their, their school. Right now, there are four schools that are open that actually um, primarily um, educate uh, physicians who are traditionally underrepresented in medicine, and that includes the Charles, um, in addition to Howard and Harry, the Charles R. Drew, which is relatively new, opening up in 1966 in L.A., <coughs> and also the Morehouse School of Medicine, the most recent school that opened up in 1975, both doing an amazing job. So why is it important? Why am I even bringing up this issue of training black physicians? Well, as I mentioned, blacks weren't able to go and get treated at many of the hospitals, <coughs> and particularly if they had segregated facilities. And even just the same way that these medical schools opened and closed, many of those hospitals <laughs> opened and closed, the same way that they did the ones that were established in the Freedmen's Bureau. And so this is an amazing story. I had the amazing opportunity to do an oral history project. In addition to kind of all the other stuff I was doing as undergrad, I happened to do an ethnographic study. In, um, in Arizona and loved the study of ethnography and loved oral history and decided I wanted to do a project. So while I was a medical student at Duke, I actually was awarded a small grant to go, met this lovely gentleman, actually through my husband, um, the Quigley's family in Chicago, North Carolina, um, happened to uh, be friends with my husband's family. And I met the wife as she was dying and she was so excited to see a black woman medical student. She was like, woohoo. She just, she just was so excited. And it opened up this door where she and I talked. Her husband, Milton, was actually the first black physician to work and set up shop in a town, small town in Tarboro, North Carolina. And so it was incredible to hear all the stories about the things that he went through. And this is him here. This is when he was well into his 80s, and he's standing here. Um, this is a phot photograph by Heather Barrett. He actually found this warehouse. It was an old fish warehouse. And what he did was he turned it into a, a medical center. It had both outpatient facilities. It had a pharmacy where he mixed medicines. He apparently had the best like, uh, cure for arthritis like all the way down the East Coast. So people would travel from Virginia and from South Carolina to come and get his arthritis remedy. I don't know what it is, and fortunately I don't need it yet. But, um, but yeah, so it was really incredible. He also had an inpatient ward. So the bottom was the outpatient ward. The top level was actually inpatient ward. And he had nurses. He, he actually was training physicians right there on the ground. So he was an amazing man. This was a picture that I took, actually, um, when I was doing the, the oral histories. And um, the, so the building is actually still there. His daughter actually um, took over the building and was opening up a holistic health clinic in there. Because her dad actually saw patients there until he was 92. That's wow. age, right? So it's incredible, right? Um, so this is actually the paper that was published out of all the issues that we did. It was so exciting. Charles Crichton Memorial Foundation. I was so grateful to get that award. But it was incredible. Here's his words, and this is why it's important to understand why I even mentioned this issue of training black physicians. Mm -hmm. What Dr. Quigley said was, African Americans were dying like flies before I got my own place. I operated on them in the country if I could, but otherwise they just died there. And sometimes they would die in a white physician's office. Now they had a back door, and the black patients would have to wait until all the white patients were seen. And then if the doctor felt like he might see them. Mm. It was an incredible, incredible disservice to those people. Can you imagine being ill and sitting there and waiting and seeing all these other people get treated before you and being told you have to sit in the back somewhere while you're in pain and agony and nobody treating you, nobody doing anything. It was horrible. And in fact, it was one of the reasons why he was recruited there to come and try to ease that burden. And in fact, he opened up his own hospital because he was unable to get medical privileges at any of the white hospitals. So he said, I'm going to open my own. Because he wanted to make sure that his black patients got the same <coughs> care that, that he would provide if they were with him. So what effect does all of that trauma, we just spent through 400 years, right? Four centuries, time work, right? What effect? does all of that trauma have on one's health? What effect does it have on a society in general? Mm -hmm. So we know, and this is a book that's not about necessarily racism, but trauma and physical health, we know that trauma impacts what people do, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Think about all the deaths that come back from war, right? They may have been exposed to war um, for several weeks, several months, 
maybe a few of them several years, but they've come back changed. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. They've come back changed because of all the atrocities that they've seen, all the horrors that they've had to witness, all the horrors that they've had to endure, all the horrors that they've had to inflict on others. And yet, people say, oh, slavery, that was, uh, people should just, they should get over it. Oh, black people, they should just get over it. You've heard that before, right? Mm -hmm. But this was centuries of an institution that was set up specifically to make sure not only did they not have health, <laughs> but they had no wealth either. And we're going to talk about why that's important in the context of health. So we know that even today racial discrimination exists. Yes, but what do we do about it? Right now we have disparities in terms of access to care, insurance coverage, receipt of appropriate therapy. I already talked about the importance of making sure our workforce is diverse. It's a challenge here. I'm actually looking at one of the other black oncologists. Mm -hmm. All right. But we have these persistent health inequities, right? Because look at this. Here we know that our population in the United States is actually expanding in terms of its racial and ethnic composition. And in fact, by 2050, it's, it's estimated that we're going to be a majority minority country, right? Mm -hmm. But look at the physician workforce. Not very diverse at all, is it? Only about 7% fall into the category of being underrepresented in medicine. We've got a lot of work to do because the community is changing and changing rapidly. <clears throat> so here's the question. Well, let's move on to cancer disparities. Is it nature versus nurture, right? People like to talk about genetics and biology. It's very important to do the research. We have amazing studies that are ongoing right here in Massachusetts. Probably about 400 or over 400 clinical trials that are open currently um, for cancer, right? Which is amazing. Or maybe it's first, I might be misstating that. But we have 400 clinical trials open at Mass. Yeah, we put it there, okay? And so it's important. So we have to look. Some of these looking at biology. Some of them are just looking at how drugs interact, whether or not different, you know, toxicity levels, etc. But it's important. But from my perspective, I think we're wasting time. There are clinical trials that clearly state that if people are treated exactly the same, randomized control trials, there are very few of them that suggest that if you treat a black person or a white person exactly the same, the black person is going to be worse. Just the opposite is true. You give people the same care, they're going to have the same outcome. Now, granted, I must say, the numbers of blacks who are in those clinical trials are very small. We've got to fix that. Very small in comparison to what we see in the community. But the bottom line is, if you treat people, they will do well. So I'm going to shift my focus onto the social determinants. That means access to care. And access doesn't just mean insurance, correct? Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Massachusetts has an uninsured rate of 1.3%. We are setting the bar really high, right, for this Affordable Care Act thing. 1.3% uninsured rate. But people still don't have access to care. There are some people who would love to come to Mass General Hospital, go to Dana Farber Cancer Institute, or head over to Tufts, but their insurance says no. That's right. There are some people who would prefer to enroll in a clinical trial, but their insurance won't allow them to go to the institution that has that trial. There are some people who might want to come to me, hello, for radiation therapy, but they can't come here. We have got to do away with that problem of access, not just with insurance, but also with respect to feeling comfortable in an institution. People don't want to talk about that, right? That's right. How do you feel when you walk into a place? Do you feel welcome? That's right. At the institutional level, are we welcoming? <laughs> are we creating an environment that actually makes people want to come? <coughs> and it's got to be all, people from all backgrounds. It's, got, it's so important. But there are social cultural barriers. Again, that trauma, that took place over those 400 years plus, it still is there. The oral histories, they get passed on from generation to generation. It doesn't go away. The racism, it still persists. There are still people who think that blacks aren't worth the treatment, that they're subhuman. There's, in fact, doctors who do experiments, medical experiments. Oh, they can't feel. They, blacks just don't. They don't have the same pain receptors. Excuse me? <laughs> All right. So. It's, it's real. But the biggest thing is socioeconomic status. And at this point, I'm going to move a little quickly, so you just stop me <laughs> if you don't understand what I'm saying. Because we are in a limited time schedule. We want to make sure that everyone is awake and not want to sleep on me. Socioeconomic status. Income, education, occupation. Income, education, and occupation. Those are the three components of socioeconomic status. 
The reason why I think it's important to cross off the issue of genes and biology, look how small of a factor is in terms of determinants of population health. It's such a small little component. Most of it is, in fact, the total ecology, the social structure that people are brought up in. That's the primary determinant of how populations and their health and well-being of populations. Health behaviors is a component, so we have to talk about health behaviors. That includes wellness. That includes making sure people are getting screened appropriately for cancer care. And then medical care also needs to be good, right? Mm -hmm. So if we have evidence to suggest that two people walk in the room and what people get treated differently, that's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. So there have to be standards put in place to make sure that mental care is equivalent in, other, in every place. And you see, this is a complex social structure, right? But there's crosstalk between each of these. Here's education, occupation, income, race and ethnicity. These all go into what happens on the policy side, but also they go into what happens with an individual in terms of their circumstance and how that impacts them, their, even their biology, their environment. Do you know what stress does to your body? It's incredible, right? Get your heart rate going up, you can be sweaty, you can have cortisol levels going up, people can become fat because they're stressed, or people can become skinny because they're stressed. It does all kinds of crazy things mm -hmm. to your physical body. Not generally, I'm talking about your mental capacities, right? So there's stress that has impact. So one of the things that we have to do is really stop, take a step back and say, well, what is health? What do we mean when we say health? I love this definition from the World Health Organization. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And it's not merely just the absence of disease or infirmity. We have a problem with the way our healthcare system is run in this country. Because we actually get paid if we treat people. We're not paid if we work on prevention. And that paradigm needs to shift, and hopefully with the Affordable Care Act, there will be some changes in that direction. So it actually sets up in our minds a little bit of a quandary, because people are saying, oh, I'm not sick, I need to go to the doctor. Wrong answer. You're not sick, that's great. Get yourself to the doctor, and make sure you check, and then continue on this journey of health and wellness. But it includes not just your physical body, it includes your spiritual, your social well-being as well. So when you look at economic disparities, and this is where I was talking about that wealth building that was problematic for those slaves who just got dumped into this in the community, inequities in work, wealth, income, education, housing, and overall standard of living directly impacts people and it impacts their health. There's a wonderful um, documentary that's called In Sickness and in Wealth, and it actually literally shows that there is a clear correlation, direct correlation between an income level and a person's health status. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you're white or black. It just happens that blacks, when they have poor socioeconomic status, or poor and low less income, do much worse even than the poor white person. Okay, So that construct in terms of wealth and health goes hand in hand regardless of race or ethnicity. But what bothers me the most, particularly for Boston, let's focus on Boston, is the fact that we have a lack of information about these things. People don't know that these health disparities exist. People don't know that they have choice in terms of their insurance products. People don't know that there are problems in terms of making sure that, or that they can speak up even. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're having a problem with your physician or you are unsure, you're unclear, ask questions. There's a lack of information. And part of the issue is compounded by the functional illiteracy rate here in, in Boston. 24%. 24% functional literacy rate here in Boston. So we, that means we have to figure out unique and innovative strategies, right, to access and educate populations. This model of social determinants, I, I um, kind of pilfered this from Barbara Ferrer, who used to be who's the former um, executive director of the Boston Public Health Commission, just to kind of show how racism, again, I and well, how it impacts all of these factors, socioeconomic status being, the, again, the number one determinant, number one social determinant of health, but also environmental exposures. You know, people, uh, kids who are living in, um, on substandard housing that might be um, have, have exposures to rat uh, feces or um, other allergens like roaches, etc. There are public housing that needs to be fixed up. Those environment exposures lead to increased rates of asthma, etc. Stress, as I talked about, other health behaviors that are impacted. Can you walk in your neighborhood? You have a safe neighborhood to walk in. Come on. You feel good about your kids walking, right? Those are all sorts of things. And then access to testing and screening. Do you have access? These are all things that racism impacts and therefore impacts health outcomes. So this is an interesting model. I'm going to um, just move through this quickly because I think what I want to do is focus on these three uh, components. These are the three uh, measurements of social determinants, and that's policy, 
right? So at the policy level, and that actually impacts the more the socioeconomic, the, eco the ecology, what the person is exposed to, um, but also the personal, you know, individual choice. There's individual choice and how that impacts their health, and then the community, and that's where you all are going to come in. So let's talk about personal choice and cancer outcomes. Tobacco and alcohol consumption. We know that overuse or use of tobacco leads to cancer, not just lung cancer. It can increase your rates for bladder cancer, and breast cancer, and prostate mm -hmm. cancer, and just cancer, right? So, you want to ask, why do it? It's a personal choice. Alcohol use, increased alcohol use can also lead to cancers. But there are other things. Substance use, which may put people at, at risk for other um, risky sexual practices, mm -hmm. obesity. Um, also, whether or not people elect like to get screened or not. Whether or not they get treated, what treatments they go for. Are they enrolling in clinical trials? Also, survivorship. What happens after they get a diagnosis of cancer? All of those things. Those are personal choices that impact cancer outcomes. And then policy change. I must say, this is one that I didn't understand until I got involved with Coleman here in, um, in Massachusetts, where oral parity. So what happens is insurance carriers would oftentimes cover IV <coughs> cancer therapies. But there were, weren't covering medications that were taken by mouth. So black women, lower incidence of breast cancer, higher mortality rate. Black women who had estrogen positive tumors who had been recommended to get tamoxifen as a way to improve their outcomes, they couldn't get it mm -hmm. if they were on Medicare or if they actually had a Medicaid product. Yes. So we know that the use of tamoxifen helps to improve outcomes, but they couldn't get it because of the insurance product. It was a loophole. And so that loophole had to be closed, but the problem is, is that not, it's not a national closure, it's by state by state. And so what's interesting, as of today, I believe there are 30 states that now have, this is a little bit of an old map, this is from 2013, but you know, there are all of these states here that do not have oral parity, meaning that the government or the state government requires those insurers to actually pay for the oral medications. And the issue, the reason why that's important is because now with targeted therapies, meaning we're now focusing on saying, well, how do things work at the cellular level? Are there things that we can target? Many of those targeted agents are actually oral pills, which yeah. is phenomenal, yeah. right? So if we're making progress by leaps and bounds in terms of what we're doing on the medical side, but people don't have access to that's going to just widen that disparity gap even further. So what's amazing is that Governor Deval Patrick here signed that, um, the law into a new bill, into Chapter 403, uh, back in, in January of 2013. So we do now have oral parity here in the state of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So in the last five minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about community engagement, um, innovative strategies that are designed to impact health equity. Um, what is community engagement? I love this quote. Community engagement is the art of creating partnerships through the exchange of information and expertise that will empower and strengthen both the internal and the external community. So remember, each of us sitting here is part of multiple communities. Right? So I'm part of the black community, I'm part of the faith-based community, I'm part of the medical community. And so we all have different communities that we exist in. And so how do we select which community we're going to focus in on, right? Well, if you can see that there's a difference in terms of equity in one community or another, doesn't it make sense that if we fix some of the issues that are happening in that particular community, that everyone benefits? That makes sense to me, but maybe not to others. But I love this. Let's look at Boston's changing demographics, and the reason why I think we have a golden opportunity here is because our demographics are already reflective of what's going to happen to the rest of the country, right? So if you look here in 1980, 68% of Boston was white. And you can see over time that has quickly changed to now, at the last of the 2010 census, it was 47%. It's now um, a little bit less than that. So we're now a majority non-white city. And that's what's going to happen to the rest of the country. So we have an opportunity here to fix some of these issues, to kind of come up with, with innovative strategies on how to make this better. I'm not going to go through this. I'm going to pass this. Those just showing that income and education were both lower in both African American and also Hispanic communities here in Boston. I think we probably know that. I did want to highlight some of the innovative strategies that happened right here in my medical community at Mass General Hospital. The Disparity Solutions Center is here at Mass General Hospital. It really works at the policy level and also at the institutional level. We've got to build programming to help um, institutions who are interested in improving the diversity of their workforce, et cetera, to come up with um, programming around that. And they've actually received the first American Hospital Association Award ever 
um, for a, a, the equity care award. And they work a lot around making sure, even just simple things like, do you have a hospital interpreter? You know, it, you know, you have communities that don't speak English as their primary language. Do you have a hospital interpreter to make sure they understand what's going on in terms of the medical data? Um, I also want to kind of highlight the Center for Community Health Improvement. I saw Joan. Joan, yeah, hi. There's Joan Newman, who actually is um, the director of that program, and also she's uh, now a vice president for um, community health here at the hospital. Um, I must say, I was blown away by Chelsea. So Chelsea at the center is a part of Mount Shadow Hospital. They have amazing facilities there. They also work really well with the policymakers in the city, right? So in order to affect change, it can't just be one component. There has to be a partnership. And that's what I love about MGA Chelsea is they've done a fantastic, phenomenal job all around in terms of making sure that individuals are taken care of. They have a huge influx of um, immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is that I was talking to the director there, um, um, McWilliams, um, and she was Jeanette McWilliams, and she was saying that you know, they have to essentially do a community assessment every <laughs> couple of years, which they do. And it's interesting to show the shifts in populations. So one year they may need to get a Somali interpreter or whatever, and then the next year they're looking for something else. But they're looking at their community proactively and saying, what do we need to do to meet the needs of our community? I must also kind of applaud my colleagues. So Dr. Chris Lathan, who's here, has worked with Whittier, um, the Whittier um, Health um, Community Center, to really figure out, is there a way with respect to cancer care to bring cancer care closer to the community so it doesn't feel so far away and so difficult to access? And he's established a, committee, uh, a, a, a clinic there that's run by um, special, uh, specialized nurses who actually can provide access. And physicians go once a week, and they, they go there, they see patients, they answer questions, they don't. It's, it's just a wonderful um, example. And the fact of the matter is he's willing to share. So I must say, this is a picture of us, of Chris and I um, here. I had a medical student who came and worked with me during the summer. Eventually, he stole her. I mean, he worked with her most of the time. <laughs> she was able to do a nice little assessment of the first year of that, of that operation. So it's a wonderful collaboration. All right, so do we have any pink and black ambassadors in the house? Anyone? Woohoo! Yes, all right. So the Pink and Black campaign was another beautiful collaboration. <clears throat> Mayor's office in 2008 saw that there was this um, reduction in terms of how many black women were getting screened for mammography. Um, and so we had this campaign. Many of you may have seen it. It was plastered all on the side of huge buses and billboards where they had these amazing women who were saying, look, I have breast cancer. I'm a survivor. I can, if I did this, you can do this. Go get screening. Screening is the way, right? Early detection saves lives. And it was amazing. And what was cool was that in association with the Pink and Black campaign, there were oftentimes speakers. I got to be one. I was so happy to kind of be involved in that progress process. And it was actually through the Dana-Farber um, Community Benefits Office that I was actually encouraged and allowed to do some of that work in the community. The beautiful thing is, is that if you look at mammography screening rates, look at that. Blacks are getting screened at a higher rate than whites, mm -hmm. same as Hispanics. So it can work. There are great examples of things that work. <clears throat> also looking at faith-based initiatives, I've worked with both um, the Greater Love Tabernacle, other churches, um, Budget Life in Cambridge. This is actually an educational symposium that was given through the Prostate Health Education Network. There are so many opportunities. This particular one was held at 12th Baptist. Um, and so we've got to engage our faith-based communities. Again, looking at these beautiful pictures, it has to go beyond pictures. We've got to start working and putting some actions behind those words. Mm -hmm. Faces of faith. Okay, so instead of just raising your hands, could people who have really donated their time and being willing to share, any of our Faces of Faith members, would you please just stand and be recognized? acknowledge the photographer because he did an amazing job um, and this is a wonderful project and again there are now over 30 um, individuals who have participated so thank you all for sharing your stories and being willing to do that. We don't have time to really go much into this but I want to make sure that you guys get handouts about the Lazarus MJ's Cancer Care Equity Program. It's a new program that's been up and running for the past year that really strives to improve access to clinical trials. Clinical trials may be the best option particularly if you've been through multiple courses of therapy and about working, it's an opportunity to have some of the most innovative um, medications or treatments that are available, and we cannot in the black community be shying away from them. We're dying because we're not participating. 
And we need to make sure that whenever new drugs are coming to the market, work as well in us as they're working in other folks with all the stresses and other things that are going on. So it's an important thing that we have got to work on. Look at our city. It's all it's so very segregated, but we've got to learn how to work together. This is a map of Boston, by, and it's, all these plots are by race. Here's all the black people. Here's where the cancer centers are. Here's Mass General Hospital in the top. You'd think it would take really long to get there, right? People say all the time, oh, Mass General Hospital is so long. It, it takes, too, takes too long. Too far away. <laughs> so I mapped it out. <laughs> so go ahead now. It's actually faster to get to Mass General Hospital than to go to BMC. So there. That's right. All right? <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, though, if you look at the spot, so here you've got Mission Hill, Mass General and BMC. So the bottom line is people need to know that they have options. They need to have options. And whether it be we going to our politicians and saying, we want to have options, we want to make sure that all insurance allows us to have equal access to care, it's important. I do want to talk about the community assessment project that we're currently doing. You see Elmer sitting right there. Um, who's the director of the Center for Community Health Education and Research and Service. He's also the director of the Office of Urban Health Policies and Programs. Um, he had um, Linda Spray Martinez, who's actually an amazing professor. She's well published in this area of community engagement, um, are working to really do an assessment around what people's thoughts are about cancer care here in the city um, so that we can't fix a problem if we don't know what the problem is. We've got to understand where people are and meet them right there. So this project is ongoing. Um, some of the barriers, we already know what they are. You know, poverty, health system, fear, etc. We've got to work on ways to do that. And so I'm going to leave it there. I was going to show some things that we've been doing in the Cancer Care Equity Program, but I know time is limited. And I really want to make sure that we have time for questions and answers. So thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And I would love to take questions at this time.